this last uh, conference that we have together is to try and bring together and reinforce some of the themes that I have uh, uh, more formally presented. And what I'd like to do is begin with a bit of a story, a kind of analogy that may help to envision uh, the whole question of the liberal idea uh, as I have defined it, the old liberal idea that prizes the uh, autonomy of the individual human person, of free exchange, of the rights of conscience, and, and all of the rest. And the analogy I would use is to remark on where I live in Michigan. I live in a religious community with some other priests, and when we moved into that house a good number of years ago, there was in the front of the house a huge tree. And I rather liked that tree because it gave shade to the front porch so that we could sit out on the porch in the summer and uh, relax and have conversation. And I noticed as I looked up to the top of that tree that part of the tree was blossoming. There were leaves. But another part of the tree looked dry and dead and so we called for someone who is an expert in the care of trees, what they call in the United States a tree doctor. And he came to our community and he looked at the tree. He took some of the bark off the tree and he examined some of the soil that the tree was in. He held some of the leaves and examined them. And he came and said, I'm sorry to tell you that the tree is dead. And I said, but how can the tree be dead? I see that part of it is blossoming. And he said, no, it, it looks like it's alive. But really what's happening is the sap in the tree is working its way through it so that it has the illusion of still being alive. But in fact, it's no longer growing. And year after year, less and less of those branches will blossom You'll have more and more dead limbs on the tree and less and less green leaves. And he said the really sad thing is that we have to cut the tree down because it's becoming weaker. And if there is ever a storm, it is possible that this tree will blow over onto the house and do great damage to the house. I've often thought of the analogy of that tree with regard to the culture that we live in in the West. There is a real legacy that we are living off of, of the past. But in the modern era, era, we seem to forget what the roots are to the prosperity and to the authentic and justifiable liberality of our societies. Uh, we think that we can have all of the benefits without contemplating the roots. And I'm afraid that the tree has been weakened over the years and that many of us have lived off of the fruits of a past age without understanding the ideas that created so firm and beautiful a civilization as we know as Western civilization. And despite what many secular advocates in the West, say today, especially in Europe, but increasingly so also in the United States, despite what they say, I want to argue that it was the root of a belief in God, of the biblical religion, the Judeo-Christian religion, that helped to form a society that had become so prosperous and so liberal as the one in which we have uh, lived in. And there are several ideas at the root of this, and they begin in what might be considered um, a very vague sort of way, a presupposed sort of way that we see in the early pages of the Bible, but that would eventually, over time, evolve into the institutions of the liberal idea. So I want to begin with the Judeo concept of the creation. Most of us uh, who know the biblical story recall that the God in the book of Genesis who creates the heavens and the earth 
is a God who is active and creative and is the origin of both the spiritual, the heavens, and the material reality, the physical and the spiritual. So the first thing we want to say is that there is a harmony between the spiritual and the physical. And then also, in that first book of the Bible, we have the story of the creation of man and woman. I'm not addressing myself to the question of whether this is a historical story or whether it's a story that contains meaning, as in a myth. I'm only talking about the way in which this story will affect the way in which the Judeo-Christian civilization, Western civilization, would conceive the human person and his place in the world. And in that story, we have a vision of humanity as being a composite of both heaven and earth. So the human person in this vision, in this presupposition, in this ancient anthropology, if you will, this human person is a composite of the whole universe. It says that God forms man from the dust of the earth and breathes into him the breath of life. So in this vision, we are both corporeal and transcendent. Now that has a great impact in the way we view ourselves in the world. This means that we must take account of the physical needs and reality and limitations in which we exist. But that in the process of doing that, we are also transcendent beings. What eventually would, ev would evolve from the, these notions, these presuppositions, would be both the reality that human beings must work, therefore must have some structures that protect their ability to work, but that the human being who works is also the human being who is made in the image and likeness of God, who possesses an eternal, immortal dignity, who has a destiny beyond this world. I described this previously as the relationship between faith and reason. Faith speaking the, to the transcendent and reason speaking to the contingent. This harmony between faith and reason is what prevents human beings from simply treating others as ends for their own purposes. The human person made in the image and likeness of God, who possesses this dignity, who is individual by nature, who has free will and moral agency, and because of moral agency, that is, can make choices for good or for evil, has also moral responsibility. This being is a unique being in the midst of all creation. Is part of creation, but also has a responsibility for creation. That is, for the whole world. And then several ideas begin to emerge, and then eventually institutions will begin to emerge from this cosmological vision, the heavens and the earth, and anthropological vision, uh, vision, transcendence and corporality, physicality. To protect the human person in his freedom and in his creativity, because in being made in the image and likeness of God, we are being made we are made in the creative nature of God, to protect the human person in his freedom and creativity emerges the right to property. The notion that when I mix my labor with the physical world, I have the right to possess what I have drawn out of nature. Let us remember that wealth does not exist in a state of nature. If wealth existed in a state of nature, then Brazil would be rich and Japan would be poor. But in point of fact, despite the fact that Brazil has many more natural resources, it is poorer than Japan, which has virtually no natural resources to speak of. The source of wealth has to be something else. It's not just the existence of natural resources, but it's the capacity of the human mind to see and to perceive and to draw out of nature a use for resources to serve other people. That is the source of wealth, not material 
uh, resources in and of themselves, but the human mind. As John Paul II says in his encyclical Centesimus Sanus, man is man's greatest resource, precisely because of this creative capacity of the human mind. So, as creation moves forward, as human history progresses, the right of private property emerges to protect this creativity. And then, of course, if you have right, the right of private property, somebody can come and say, well, really, that's my property. Or if you loan somebody property or given them property to invest and you want a return on that property, all of this necessitated some kind of juridical structure that would enforce contracts, so the right to contract, court systems, systems of law, juridical systems, all of these systems would emerge based on this anthropological assumption that is at the heart of the Judeo-Christian culture. To enable people to settle disputes among themselves, not based on force, but based on law. And then there would be the right to initiative, the right to be creative in order to draw this, um, this uh, wealth from a state of nature by transforming it, by using the mind, this initiative that would be involved. And then, of course, all of the things that surround this, because one can have initiative, but then one has to have the right to express oneself, the right to conscience. All of these other things begin to emerge slowly, to be sure, gradually, to be sure. And, of course, there are back and forths. That is, there is progress, and then there are... Uh, uh, steps back. My point is that Judeo-Christian culture was at the root of much of this development. And then there was the division of labor. In my first lecture I alluded to the fact that the Jewish people had uh, separate systems of customs and law and traditions that identified themselves and demarcated themselves from the cultures in which they lived. Uh, among the first um, uh, uh, effort to divide power takes place in ancient Israel. You might say that the seeds of federalism occur when Moses finds himself overwhelmed as a judge in Israel and the scriptures say that God told him to break the camps down into smaller and smaller groups and to appoint judges and that he should only decide the most important issues that confronted the nation. This breakdown or this division of power really emerges and is reinforced by Jesus in the gospel that I also alluded to when I said uh, that there was a distinction between God and Caesar when I alluded to the scripture that says that Jesus takes the coin and says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, Caesar's and what, uh, unto God what is God's. This division between what we might call authority and power. Let me just take a moment to, to delineate that because I think it's important. My distinction here between authority and power and what I'm about to say comes from a sociologist by the name of Robert Nisbet who describes this in his book Quest for Community. Uh, he says that both power and authority are forms of constraint. But authority is a form of constraint that is external to the human person. Whereas, I'm sorry, just the reverse. Power is a form of constraint that is external to the person and authority is a form of constraint that is internal. Here's what he means by that. Authority exists in any culture where traditions and norms are observed. When a gentleman takes off his hat in the presence of a lady, when he lets a woman go through the door first, when a husband greets his wife and she reminds him that they have a commitment in the morning to go to do something, even though he may have wanted to go play golf, he submits to that not because of the fear of coercion in most cases, but because of his covenant with his wife, because he acquiesces to the authority that they have by virtue of their marriage. In a multiplicity of ways, society exists by this recognized authority that is a form of constraint, that is, it constrains my behavior, but it is internal to me. 
It is something that I believe in, something that I buy into. Power is a different form of constraint. Power is a form of constraint that is external and does not require my acquiescence. It does not require the conforming of my will, merely the conformance of my actions. And this is generally where coercion is initiated. Now, that may have a legitimacy, and indeed does have a legitimacy, as when one person would steal property from another person or kill another person, they should be constrained by force not to do that. So there's a legitimate role for power, but it must always be limited. Uh, in making this distinction between authority and power, as Jesus did in the Gospels, as we go back to uh, um, ancient Israel where power is divided, we see a very important institution that would emerge. Uh, it would be defined later on as federalism. In Catholic social teaching, it is called the principle of subsidiarity. Subsidiarity, very unlike the definition that the European Union has given to this word, historically subsidiarity was not that the central state has the first right to act, but in point of fact the first actors must be those most local, most proximate to the need. And only when there is a manifest failure at each level of social organization can any kind of central social organization act. So that the principle of subsidiarity says that needs are best met by the most local level of their existence and that the central government should be a resource of last resort, not the resource of first resort. Uh, in addition to this division of, of um, authority in society through subsidiarity, which shows a reverence for human beings, we have the principle of solidarity. Solidarity basically says that I recognize myself in every other human being. When I see someone in distress, someone in profound need, I feel linked to them. I feel in solidarity with them. This is a Christian notion, not a socialist notion, not a Marxian notion, but really is first and foremost a Christian notion that we recognize ourselves in the needs of others. Uh, what emerges then from both the principle of subsidiarity and the principle of sub, uh, solidarity are institutions of charity. And I want to take a moment here because it is important to understand this. Of course charity and some, in some sense solidarity, it might not be called that, but solidarity exists in all cultures because it's a natural part of the human heart. But uh, human beings and charity has existed in almsgiving for centuries. It was only in the Judeo-Christian West that institutions of charity would emerge that would be institutionalized. This is very important. The institutional structure of Christianity, because of its reverence for the created world, because of the doctrine of the incarnation, that God comes to the human race in the person of Christ, respecting the structures of history, respecting the material world, that cause the church to build institutions and its universality, which I spoke about in the, uh, the second uh, series, uh, second in this series, this institutional nature of the church and its universal vision enabled international and, and institutions of charity to emerge. It is not a coincidence that in the same uh, way hospitals as caring institutions emerge in uh, Europe because nuns would take people into convents, they had the first hospices, and then they institutionalized the care of the sick and the sanitation uh, uh, in their care that would emerge as the hospital, and then also, of course, the university as well, as Lord Acton describes in a number of his essays. This globalized vision of humanity is very key that emerges again from human solidarity uh, that is not in the first instance political. Today in many cases we speak about um, 
globalization is a threat, and indeed, if it is the wrong kind of globalization, it can become a threat. When we speak of the globalization of states reaching beyond their borders to control the lives uh, and the decision-making of other people, this is the kind of globalization that fails to respect human dignity. And states can do this not only through direct intervention, but can do it by manipulating or, in effect, owning businesses that, uh, that go into uh, uh, other countries. Uh, or when local governments, in effect, buy uh, the, or license uh, the entrance into their markets of businesses. This is a very different thing than trade among people as business people, rather than the kind of political trade that is the form of globalization, that is deleterious, that is threatening to human well-being. Because in this form of trade, people are being coerced. They're being manipulated. They're having to pay uh, for entrance into a market. When entrance into a market takes place because people want to buy a good or a service, or want to offer their services to uh, a business, all of this is predicated on human free will, which is what uh, both protects the the right of choice of the people involved and the right of contract and the dignity of the person and being able to make uh, the, the choice, but also increases the intelligence in society as a whole because each of those people making decisions are making those decisions based on subjective knowledge that they have. And so when they are permitted to do this in a cooperative way that creates not the kind of economic hostility that Marx describes in his writings, but the economic harmonies that Friedrich Bastiat describes in his writings, this promotes a common well-being, a common prosperity, a promotion of a common good that exists in society as a whole. Uh, I believe it was Bastiat who once said that when goods cross borders, armies tend not to. And so uh, I bring all of this to a, its kind of conclusion by saying, that human beings who are created with this inestimable dignity, this intrinsic dignity that is part and part of their nature, uh, have a destiny beyond this world that no state and no civic organization can determine for them. That when people are allowed to act freely and peaceably with each other, it is, most, it is the, most, um, uh, the most likely that human betterment will result. Uh, I don't propose this as a utopia, but I propose this as uh, perhaps the best and most efficient way of governing ourselves in a world with such diversity uh, and plurality of opinion.